All right, so let's begin my first, um, our first pre-recorded video. In this video, I would like to address a point that for some strange reason, the textbook doesn't actually talk about. But I think that's one of the critical points in analyzing any type of policy that intervenes in the free market. All right, so let's start with our basic supply demand diagram. We have price, quantity, we have a downward sloping demand curve, we have an upward sloping supply curve. Uh, let me use a different color. And here at the intersection of demand and supply, we have the market equilibrium, equilibrium price, and equilibrium quantity. So all nice and easy. And now Let's remember what exactly is the demand curve. What does it represent? What is every point on this demand curve? Every point on the demand curve is a customer. A person, a business, that doesn't matter. And each point on the demand curve, and we have discussed this in our live lecture, represents the maximum willingness that the customer is willing to pay. That is what demand curve is. And the greater is the quantity, the lower is the willingness to pay. That's ultimately the reason why demand curve slopes down. So let's take this customer right here. This customer is willing to pay a lot. And let's say that our equilibrium price, just for the sake of argument, is 20 bucks. Doesn't matter. This person right here is willing to pay 80 bucks. For now, we will talk about what we call single price markets. Single price market basically means you go into a shop and everyone pays the same price. Nobody cares how much you're willing to pay. The only thing that matters, as long as you are willing to pay more than $20, you'll purchase the product. If you're willing to pay less, then you'll be out of the market. Later on um, in the day, we'll talk about price discrimination. That's when um, firms actually are able to charge different prices to different groups of customers. Think, well, back in the day when travel was possible, think of airline tickets. So anyway, this person is very happy. This person realizes what is called the consumer surplus. This person is willing to pay 80 bucks, but only has to pay 20. And as we go down the demand curve, we then have this person willing to pay slightly less, but still way higher than 20. And so on and so forth until until we reach a person who is willing to pay exactly 20 bucks for this product. Right. So then we move to a person who is willing to pay $19 and that person is irrelevant because that person will not be purchasing that product. This triangle right here is what we call CS, consumer surplus. I don't care for the formal definition. Basically, it measures the well-being of your consumers, the well-being of people who, or businesses that are on the demand side. Well, you probably figured out that on the supply side is the same thing. Remember, supply is upward sloping. And what does a supply curve represent? Supply curve represents the minimum, the minimum price that suppliers are willing to accept. What is the minimum price that you are willing to accept for your product? We talked about that, and that is the cost. The cost is increasing. Again, the reason is pretty, pretty obvious. The reason the costs are increasing is that the most productive resources are employed first. If you are farming, you utilize the most productive land first. If you are hiring, you hire the best worker first. And as you increase your production, you have to start utilizing worse and worse resources. And that's the reason why it's called. So same thing here. The market price is 20 bucks. The supplier right here is willing to accept as little as three. Right? This person or business, whatever, realizes what we call the producer surplus. The same exact logic applies. Okay. 
PS stands for producer surplus. Now, this is very important. What is a, an objective of any good economic policy? The objective is to maximize the total surplus in the economy. It's to maximize the overall shaded area. We will be considering three types of intervention into the market. Price ceilings, price floors, and taxes. We will conclude that the policy is socially efficient if the overall shaded area grows. If the sh shaded area shrinks, that will be an indication that the policy is not socially efficient. That's as simple as that. That's the only thing that you need to look for when you are analyzing an economic policy from the perspective of its efficiency. Does it increase the surplus? Again, surplus, you can think about it, the total surplus is total happiness, total satisfaction in our economy. And it doesn't really matter whether it goes to the consumer or it goes to the producer. So let's consider the most basic form of intervention into the free market, which is the price ceiling. So again, let me make this graph a little bit larger. Again, we have price, quantity, downward sloping demand, and an upward sloping supply. Again, we have an equilibrium price, 20 bucks. Some equilibrium work, it doesn't matter. Right, so remember, in order for a price ceiling to have an effect on the market, where does it have to be? It actually has to be below the market price. If you are selling something for 20, and then uh, basically the government tells you, well, you cannot sell it for more than 22, then your response will be, well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm already selling it for less than the price ceiling. So in order for a price ceiling to have a binding effect on the market, it has to be below the equilibrium price. So let's say for the sake of argument, the price ceiling okay. Now, what will be the most immediate effect of a price ceiling? When the price is somehow below its equilibrium value, the impact of that is what? Well, it's a shortage. Of course, a lot of people want to purchase the product at a low price, but very few suppliers are actually willing to sell it at that low price. The result is disequilibrium, the result is a shortage. So, who wins from a price ceiling? It is a very, very common misconception to think that consumers win from this situation. That is just not true. Some consumers win. Which ones? The ones that managed to elbow their way up the line and grab this product at this low price. Which consumers will lose? The ones who ended up locked out of this market because again, we have this shortage. So who wins again? So consumers who purchase the product. Then next, who loses? Well, first of all, these are the consumers that got locked out of the market. I am old enough to remember the Soviet Union when the prices were not set by the forces of supply and demand. They were set by the Central Planning Committee of the Communist Party. And only God knows what logic they used in setting up the prices, but they were continuously in disequilibrium. So you end up standing in a line for a product for five hours, and there is absolutely no guarantee that by the time you get to the front, you actually um, get this product. There is another consideration here as well. What is the logic behind the price ceiling? How would politicians, how would policymakers justify a price ceiling? 
And normally the logic that you hear is we need to protect lower income consumers by imposing the sale. But that logic isn't doesn't quite hold water. Because there is absolutely no guarantee, absolutely no guarantee that lower income consumers will actually benefit from this. Again, these are the people who managed to elbow their way to the front of the line. I remember um, in Florida, after hurricanes, when I was living in Miami, where I did my doctoral studies, uh, there was a price ceiling on petrol following the hurricanes. And there were huge lines for petrol stations. And the, I still remember the person in front of me was driving a Lamborghini. Certainly that person wasn't the target <laughs> consumer um, for, for this type of a policy. Who else loses? Well, producers do, because now producers charge lower prices. Okay, so we cannot yet conclude that this is a bad policy. It kind of sounds intuitive that it is, but we cannot conclude it yet because we have someone who wins, again, consumers who purchase the product. We have parties who lose, but maybe, just maybe, the gains of winners actually outweigh the losses of losers. And if that is the case, we can conclude that the policy is socially efficient. So, let's look. Well, first of all, this is our new quantity. Okay, whatever happens on um, well, left-hand side if I face this way, or right-hand side if I face this way, um, is irrelevant, because that is not going to be produced. So this is our new quantity right here. Okay, so let's use exactly the same logic as we did in this graph and shade the surplus. Let's start with the easy one. Let's start with the producer surplus. Wow. Yeah. Slightly different scale, but you can see that the producer surplus has clearly shrunk. Producers are clearly the losers in this scenario. Right. All right, what about consumer surplus? Well, again, it's the difference between what you are willing to pay, right here, that's the demand curve, and what you have to pay, which is right here, which is 15 bucks, the new price ceiling. No longer the equilibrium, it's irrelevant. So that's our CS for consumer surplus. Now, when you compare this with this, it's actually difficult to say which one is larger because, well, some consumers do win, some consumers lose. But I can unequivocally conclude that this policy is not socially efficient. Why? You can see that part of this shaded area has evaporated. This right here no longer goes to consumers, no longer goes to producers. This part of the surplus has been lost. If I give you 20 bucks, you become $20 richer, I become $20 poorer. The overall wealth in our system doesn't change. It's not an inefficiency. What would be inefficiency if I give you 20 bucks, but you only receive 10? That's a dead weight loss. And that's essentially what happens here. This DWL, standing for a dead weight loss, again, part of the surplus that simply goes to no one. And that is the only thing, the only thing that you need to look for when I ask you a question, for example, in your test, whether a certain policy is socially efficient or not. This policy is not socially efficient, and the reason why is we have a presence of a dead weight loss. Thank you.